Hello, I'm Matthew Hood, Vice President of Government Relations at Dartmouth Health. Government Relations is so pleased to roll out the 2022 We Care, We Vote initiative. We Care, We Vote is a nonpartisan voter education initiative designed to encourage participation in the 2022 midterms. We do this by providing information on registering to vote and voting in New Hampshire and Vermont. You can find these resources on the Dartmouth Health website under Health Policy. As a 501c3 organization, Dartmouth Health does not engage in election intervention activities meaning we don't tell people whom to vote for, but we do invite all candidates for discussions so that we can learn where they stand on issues and have an opportunity to ask questions. I wanna thank you for your engagement and remind you to vote on November 8th. I'm Dr. Maria Padin, Chief Medical Officer for Dartmouth Health Southern Region Community group practice. Welcome to today's latest session of We Care, We Vote Health Policy Grand Rounds. With me today is Congressman uh, Chris Pappas, incumbent candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives representing New Hampshire's first congressional district. Congressman Pappas has served in the seat since 2019. Representative Pappas serves on the House Veterans Affairs Committee and the chair's Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee. Prior to serving in DC, he served as a New Hampshire Executive Counselor for six years. Welcome, Congressman Pappas. Thank you very much, Maria. It's great to be with you. You have been representing New Hampshire now uh, since 2019, before the pandemic. Can you tell the audience a bit about your experience and why you're seeking re-election? Well, thanks for the opportunity, and I appreciate the work that you do that goes on here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Um, it hasn't been an easy few years for anyone in healthcare, and we've just appreciated the way that uh, our men and women uh, on the front lines of the uh, pandemic and of so many other public health challenges have responded in a, in a way that has kept the people of New Hampshire safe. So thank you very much. I'm running for my third term. Uh, I've served in Congress for four years. Uh, I come at this from uh, the perspective of a small business owner and a lifelong resident here in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, and I think our solutions are found somewhere in the middle. Uh, we've got to look for more ways to work together to find bipartisan solutions to the challenges that this nation faces uh, in ensuring that we're putting a priority on healthy, safe, strong communities. Um, we benefit when everyone is insured in this country and people are getting uh, the primary care and wellness visits that they need. Uh, we benefit when our communities are safe, when we have strong public education and a safe, clean environment. Uh, so some of the work that I've done in Congress includes passing a major infrastructure law to invest in our roads and bridges and high-speed broadband in this country, um, opening up doors of care for millions of veterans who have been exposed to toxic substances and burn pits, uh, making sure that we're investing in the future of this country, including manufacturing, by making more microchips and other critical components here in the United States. I believe in a future that's stamped with made in America. And I think as we look at some of the challenges as we come out of this pandemic and the economic crisis that it has spawned, uh, we've got to make sure we're focusing on lowering costs, uh, whether that be for prescription drugs, energy, healthcare, uh, and also to think about the kind of future that we can create together. So I envision a collaborative future where uh, we all hear each other out and find the best solutions. And uh, we need a lot more of that sort of common sense perspective in Washington these days. Well, I would agree. I think the common sense uh, perspective and collaboration are critical. And I think we saw a fair amount of that collaboration during the pandemic when responses were required fairly rapidly. Um, you talked a little bit about supply chain. Um, and first of all, I think we want to express our appreciation because we know that there was a, a lot of heavy lifting that happened to be able to keep our workforce being able to provide that care that you spoke about. And thank you for that acknowledgement during the, the crisis. Um, and we're still in some challenging times, um, particularly as you um, discussed with supply chain. Um, and I'm happy to hear some of the things that you're thinking about in terms of production in the U.S. for some of these critical pieces. But the other thing I wanted to ask you a little bit about is, um, you know, coming out of this pandemic, we still are facing some pretty significant uh, challenges. Um, what waivers and flexibilities um, that have been put in place by CMS during the pandemic, would you continue to support um, maybe becoming permanent to be able to allow us to continue to have that access to patient care? Yeah, 
Well, I think what's happened with telehealth over the last couple of years has been a game changer for healthcare. And it's been really important to connect patients with providers, with specialists, with the care that they need. And this is helpful in a number of different areas. I've heard from uh, recovery coaches, from mental health providers, from primary care providers who've been able to connect with patients uh, either online over like a Zoom platform or telephonically. So some of these temporary changes that were made to facilitate this during the pandemic absolutely should be permanent. We've extended um, some of that authorization through the end of this year, but we really need a permanent fix that works for providers, both our small community healthcare uh, you know, centers, as well as our larger hospitals and healthcare systems in New Hampshire. So I wanna to continue to work with our provider community to make sure we're getting it right in terms of the telehealth rules. Uh, a number of other things were done during the pandemic to help our healthcare systems financially be able to make it through this period. And I think to the extent that uh, any additional support is needed to support our hospitals and our healthcare systems, uh, we should be looking to do whatever it takes to make sure that care is within uh, reach of patients who need it. Uh, and that financially our, our hospitals and providers are in a strong position. So I think we've learned a lot of lessons from the last few years. I'll say this with respect to um, the personal protective equipment and the supplies that we need. Uh, obviously we were caught short. Uh, this is not just a, an economic issue, it's a health issue and a national security issue. So making more of these critical things right here in the U.S. is so important. Uh, we saw you know, nurses and um, you know, folks who were working in ERs making gowns and masks to help meet the need. I was at Manchester Airport regularly when shipments of this stuff was being flown in from overseas. But we know we've got the industrial capability here and the know-how to be able to meet this challenge here domestically. Um, and so um, we're going to continue to work on this issue to make sure that our supply needs are met and that we're onshoring uh, the production of critical components, including the type of PPE that we need. Well, I, we are appreciative of that, and I think that the supply chain issue certainly is one that we have felt um, very closely, at, you know, sort of hitting home as healthcare providers. You talked a little bit about um, <clears throat> maintaining that accessibility um, to healthcare access um, and our ability to deliver that care as well. Um, many of Dartmouth Health's patients rely on Medicare as their source of health insurance. And the 2022 Medicare Board of Trustees annual report had some uh, predictions that were, I think, worrisome not only to providers but to our patients with regards to um, the long-term funding um, of Medicare and its ability to fulfill um, its um, promise to the people. Um, in addition, CMS have, has proposed annual Medicare payments that do not keep pace with Medicare inflation. What will you do to ensure that Medicare is available and that all seniors will be able to have access to the medical care they need? Yeah, well, Medicare is a bedrock program. We've got to make sure that it's there for today's seniors who have paid into the system, but also people who are working today who need to be able to look forward to a healthy and a safe retirement. Uh, it's part of the American bargain. It's something I support and we need bipartisan action to shore up the program for the future. Uh, we took a number of steps this year to help achieve savings within Medicare. One of the uh, most important accomplishments of this Congress was lowering the cost of prescription drugs uh, by ensuring that we're negotiating lower prices with the pharmaceutical companies, we're capping out-of-pocket costs for seniors, providing free vaccines, as well as $35 insulin for folks who are on Medicare. So these are important accomplishments for folks who have been struggled for too long to pay for their drugs. But there's also some great savings that can be achieved for the Medicare program to extend its solvency by negotiating lower drug prices. We'll see about 80 drugs negotiated as a result of the legislation that we passed. Uh, and I think if that effort is successful, we can continue to use the purchasing power of the American people through that program uh, to help drive costs down even further, both for patients as well as for the program, generally speaking. Um, and you know, I think Medicare, again, benefits from uh, ensuring that people throughout their lives have access to the care that they need, making sure the Affordable Care Act continues to be in place, which has important patient protections, as well as insurance coverage for folks through exchanges is really critical. We've helped bring down the cost of those exchange products so that insurance is uh, more within reach of individuals. Uh, a family of four is gonna save about $1,600 off an ACA plan as a result of the legislation that we passed this summer. 
Um, so that's important for the whole health of the individual as well as uh, the solvency of a program like Medicare as you look out into those future years. So I'm, it's unfortunate to me that there are some that would like to sort of put Medicare and Social Security on the chopping block each and every year. Um, I think we have to think long term about how we shore up those programs because they're so foundational. The other issue you asked about, which was uh, about rates uh, and reimbursement rates, which have not kept pace with inflation. Uh, and frankly, um, you know, we've been looking at this issue year after year uh, where there's been an end of year fix in Congress uh, to help set those rates at an appropriate level to support our providers to ensure that they can continue doing their work. Uh, we're looking at another fix at the end of this year. But beyond patching this on an annual basis, we need to think of a longer term strategy uh, that's going to support our providers, make sure they can con continue to keep their doors open and do the great work that they do. Well, thank you for that. Um, you know, when we talk about the access to care and we're talking about the cost of care, one thing that actually is also quite challenging to that access is having the people to deliver that care. And, uh, and one of the biggest challenges facing healthcare right now is the access to qualified workforce mm -hmm. to be able to be able to provide that care for our patient population. Um, what are your thoughts um, on how in your role you can help contribute to some of the solutions or uh, around workforce challenges that are being experienced broadly, yeah. especially in New Hampshire? It's a serious issue in New Hampshire, and we have about three job openings for every one job seeker in New Hampshire. There are thousands of open positions in healthcare. I don't need to tell you that. Um, and we need to make sure that we're recruiting good talent to come to New Hampshire, but that we're also ensuring New Hampshire is a good place for young people to get an education, to stick around, and to get right into the workforce. Um, so just kind of backing up a few steps, in terms of higher education here in New Hampshire, we know we have the most expensive in-state tuition of any state in the country. We need to make sure our colleges and universities are affordable. Um, the state of New Hampshire needs to step up in a bigger way, but we also need to do more at the federal level to expand Pell Grants and tuition assistance programs to make sure that folks can get an affordable education, get the skills and degrees that they need to get out into the workforce. Uh, and if people are going into critical areas like nursing, for instance, especially in underserved parts of our state and our country, we should be looking to pay down their loans and make sure that we have um, you know, these people working in those crit critical areas, uh, both geographically and demographically. Um, beyond that, we have to look at housing. Uh, that's another uh, non-starter for a lot of folks to be able to move to New Hampshire. Uh, we were talking earlier about mm -hmm. this issue and um, I talked to lots of folks in the public and private sector who uh, land great candidates for jobs but then can't ultimately get people to move here because we have a vacancy rate that's a fraction of a percent and we're about 20,000 housing units short statewide to meet today's demand for housing. The lack of supply is driving up costs. That's making it unaffordable for a lot of workers. So this is a serious problem. We've been working to expand some of the federal tools that are available for developers to bring about affordable housing projects, uh, including the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program and the Community Development Block Grants. Um, those are great partnerships between HUD at the federal level, our state housing uh, department, and the private sector as they look to build. Um, so we really need an all of the above approach when it comes to housing. But we've got to look at all these issues, um, education, uh, housing. New Hampshire is a great place with a good natural environment, uh, strong communities, good schools. So we have a lot going for us. Um, but we also lose half of our young people who come out of high school, mm -hmm. who move to another state and then don't start their careers here in New Hampshire. And it can be hard to get them back. So looking early on at how we open up those career pathways is going to be really important. Uh, making sure we have programs at the community college and college level here in New Hampshire uh, to support nursing, to support our medical assistance, apprenticeships uh, that, like we talked about to get people right into the workforce. Those are some important strategies that we want to support at the federal level uh, to open up those uh, pipelines and uh, help solve this crisis. It's going to take some time, um, but uh, New Hampshire is a great place to work and we just got to ensure that it continues to be affordable and attractive to everyone. Well, thank you for that. One of the other things that I think we experienced significantly and was, I think, a um, became really upfront in sort of the national awareness, I would say, around um, health was really the disproportionately poor outcomes that we saw in certain populations in this country, um, people of color, um, people from uh, 
socioeconomic backgrounds that really um, during the pandemic um, did not provide them with the ability to not to be able to stay home and anchor mm -hmm. down and uh, and as you um, continue to do this work um, as it relates to diversity equity inclusion and belonging in this country and really sort of the equity work around the social drivers and determinants of health what are your thoughts about how policy can help inf influence and impact um, that accessibility and that equity in healthcare moving forward. Yeah, that's critically important, um, especially for New Hampshire. We have underserved communities, we have new American communities, uh, we have communities that struggle economically, and we've got to make sure that uh, we level the playing field in terms of opportunities, uh, in terms of access to healthcare. Uh, community health worker programs are uh, one way that we can help. Uh, give people access and make those connections at the local level, uh, especially with communities for whom English might be a second language or who are disadvantaged uh, economically speaking. I've been a big supporter of our federally qualified community health centers. They do a great job around New Hampshire uh, and making sure they have the help and funding they need to have modern facilities that are serving people at the ground level is really important. Um, and I've done a number of other things in Congress that I think help address the economic challenges and the opportunity gap that exists in New Hampshire that uh, has a connection uh, to healthcare. So making sure that um, we're addressing the food insecurity issue, the housing insecurity issue in our state is really important. Uh, ensuring uh, that folks can get ahead and stay ahead in the economy. We're at a point in time where we're seeing inflation hitting our families that can have a ripple effect across a family's budget and can even impact uh, their health. So, um, you know, the low income heating assistance program is one program where we've been working uh, to maximize support. We've secured a record amount of money that's going to help people pay their energy bills, pay their utility bills this year. We've also supported emergency funding for rental assistance and for mortgage assistance to make sure that people don't lose their home, aren't foreclosed on as they uh, recover from a very tough economic couple of years. So I think we have to pay close attention to um, how we fill in the gaps how we serve the diverse needs of the people of New Hampshire, how we get to people in underserved areas, but also that there's a foundational level of economic opportunity in this state and that we're supporting people who are struggling uh, and need an opportunity to take that next step. Great, well, thank you for that. Um, I know we've talked about um, the continued support of telehealth, um, how we could continue to support payment around access to care, the social determinants. Um, I'd like to provide you an opportunity to just share with us maybe something I haven't asked that you think it's really important for our constituents today as they're listening to this um, interview um, in terms of how you, you know, other perspectives or ideas you have around continuing to move our state as it relates to really making it uh, the most healthiest community in, this, in the country. I would love to say that um, because that's what we strive for really is that sort of population-based health mm -hmm. that would ensure that moving forward towards the future, we have the healthiest, most productive community we can in yeah. this country. Well, I think we need um, federal policy with respect to health care that's informed by science, that's informed by people's experiences, that's informed by the expertise of our uh, great providers in New Hampshire and all across the country. I think too often we see folks who have a, an agenda and a political perspective with respect to health care um, that can either limit options, limit opportunities, or put in place extreme policies that uh, will take this country in the wrong direction. And you know, I'm referencing what the Supreme Court has done with Roe v. Wade, which I find to be uh, an affront to 50 years of precedent and people's opportunities to exist, uh, to exercise their privacy rights and their uh, personal freedoms when it comes to reproductive choice. Uh, we've seen kind of a rollback of uh, the family planning program, which is uh, really foundational to provide STD testing, annual exams, wellness visits at family planning providers in New Hampshire. Um, and we've also seen an effort over the last decade to uh, shred the Affordable Care Act, which is uh, really foundational for health care. Uh, it ensures that people can get access to an affordable plan but that there's also a basic level of coverage um, that uh, is gonna work for families when they need it. It's gonna ensure that no one with pre-existing conditions is discriminated against. So to the extent we can, and it can be challenging in politics because it's a divisive place, uh, we need to stop playing politics with healthcare. We need to focus on what's best for people, for patients, for the well-being of our communities. If we learn nothing through COVID, um, we certainly learned that we are all in this together and that we uh, are all dependent on each other being healthy, safe, and strong for the future. 
So what could be more important than ensuring that we're working toward universal coverage, uh, toward healthcare affordability, bringing down costs, uh, but also just stopping the political brinksmanship and gamesmanship around healthcare. Uh, and that's something that I'll continue to watch out for if I uh, have the opportunity to serve for another couple years. But I'm just appreciative of what uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock does. Um, it's a significant research institution. It's an economic driver for New Hampshire. Um, and your facilities all across our state are just critical access points for people. And uh, we appreciate the great care that's provided here. Well, uh, thank you, Congressman. And we really appreciate the support you have provided to um, New Hampshire health institutions during uh, the pandemic and during your uh, service. Um, and we appreciate um, you being with us today. Um, and We Care, We Vote, uh, our health policy um, update for our employees and our constituents, which is inclusive of our patients. Thank you for being with us.